Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The text for today's message is the Gospel lesson from Luke chapter 13. Options, choices, these things in many ways define our culture and our way of life. We like, we even need choices and when our choices are narrowed, we feel constrained and we feel unable to give expression to who we are as individuals. Making choices is a defining value in our nation and we find it the very root of our culture. In South America, Venezuela is a country where choices are shrinking because of the political and then also the economic situation in the country even basic food supplies, let alone other things, become, are becoming more scarce. And choices are becoming very limited. Many grocery stores in Venezuela actually pack these bags of food that people can buy. And you only buy the bag. You buy what's in the bag, no matter what it is. If you don't want it, you don't buy it. You have no real choices. A Venezuelan named Hardy Toro speaks of the conditions in his country in this way. It is very difficult to live in these conditions, first because the country has become impoverished, because there is no salary that can withstand this increase in prices, and that adds to the scarcity of almost any product. People are getting desperate and living in terrible anguish, and for that reason, many Venezuelans simply choose to leave the country. Many Venezuelans choose to leave the country. Why? Because the economic conditions make it hard to fulfill the basic needs of life, let alone to make any kind of choices. You buy what you can, you accept it, or you go to live in another place. Imagine, if you will, if this kind of thing were to happen in the United States, in our country. The choices we get to make as Americans, as U.S. citizens, are endless. To have choices taken away would prick at the heart of who we are as a nation. Choice is woven into the fabric of our culture, who we are as a people, as a nation. The reduction of choice also would reduce our identity. Choice even affects how we think about religion philosophy. How often have you heard the words, as long as they believe something, or truth is relative, or how can someone say that there's just one way? You know, there are as many good beliefs as there are people in the world. In our country, we can choose. We can choose to be Lutheran or Baptist or Catholic. We can even choose to be Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, or we can choose not to believe in God at all. We can choose to be atheist. And this is part of the challenge we have in being church in the American culture. People value and want to have choices. And to attract then the most number of people to be a church that shines brighter than the others, we have to create some sort of package, some sort of, uh, of glittery way that we can attract people's attention, that we can attract people's eyes and ears to come and to be a part of who we are. And if we're successful at this, then we have our pews full. If we aren't successful at this, then it is presumed that people will take their money elsewhere and maybe our church will shrivel up and die. This creates fear in our church. Or maybe our lives are so connected with the organization and structure that we see its failure as our failure. In order to preserve those things we value so much, we have to adapt our structure and who we are and what we do and how we progress in order to gather the eyes of people. Our cultural context do not, uh, de demands this. We must provide choice. And it is important that, in some way, we make ourselves the best loaf of bread on the shelf. The trap here is to think 
that the gospel is in some sort of competition. The truth of the matter is, there is only one truth. It is Jesus Christ the Lord. The truth of the matter is, there is only one righteousness. It is a righteousness that comes from Jesus, who died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And there is only one narrow way to eternal life. It is by the cross. It is through Jesus. There is only one way by which we have the forgiveness of sins. It is through the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are called simply to believe in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. To know that He is the only way to the Father. There is no real choice. All we have, all we need, is our Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing wrong with making changes. Sometimes change is a necessary part of the way we live in this world. It is important for us to be able to meet people where they are at. In fact, this is what Jesus did. Jesus did not stay up in heaven when he saw that we had the problem of sin. He decided to come to us and he took on humanity, he took on human form, and he became human for us. He came as a baby in a manger. He came incarnationally so that he might touch humanity, so that he might reveal the Father to you and provide for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus did this and he used human language, human touch, human ideas, human suffering, and even human pain to give the gift that we needed, the gift of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Sometimes Christ calls us as his children to be incarnational, to change and to adapt, to reach the lost and dying world. He calls us by His Spirit, according to His Word, to be His hands and His feet, to be the body of Christ, His presence to a sinful and dying world. But here's the truth of the matter. Sometimes the changes we make are not very appealing or glittery. They're not very attractive. There's nothing glitterly, glittery or attractive about Jesus dying on a cross. In fact, it's something that is stunningly difficult for, to think about. Someone dying, paying the price for the sins of the whole world, the physical suffering, and also the spiritual <coughs> suffering that is a part of it. So if we're going to change, we must ask ourselves, what is our motivation? Do we change in order to preserve and increase the institution out of fear of decline or failure? This is idolatry of what we have made with our hands. Do we change in order to make Christ a better choice? This is idolatry of self, to think that we could make Christ more than what he already is. Do we change in order to more effectively care for each other as brothers and sisters to follow the purpose that God gave to us as a church to go and tell people about Jesus, to proclaim his word so that more would come and be baptized and believe in Jesus. Do we change so that we can better reach out and touch people's lives with the gospel, a message entrusted to us? When it comes to the preservation and saving of souls, there is truly only one way. There are no choices. Salvation is simply dependent on the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's that work which connects people to the cross of Christ. And that's what we are about. That's who we are as a church. To believe in Jesus and to connect people to the cross of Christ. To his death, to his resurrection. The Lord has made you, has made us a part of that work. Second Kings tells us the story of a valiant, hard-fighting man named Naaman. Naaman is a commander of an army, and this commander is attacking and destroying Israel, the people of God. God is using this man, Naaman, to discipline his people because they have engaged in certain kinds of idolatry. Naaman, though, is not a friend of God. He doesn't believe in God. In fact, he has his own idolatry. He has his own gods whom he worships. 
But Naaman has a problem. His problem is that he has leprosy. And this is dreadful. There's swelling, there's facial disfigurement, there's nerve damage, and eventually this is a deadly disease. And Naaman has little hope. One day, though, a little girl who was taken as a slave by Naaman and given to his wife tells Naaman's wife about a prophet whose name is Elisha and that Elisha would be able to heal Naaman from the disease that he has in his body. So Naaman goes to Elisha and he humbles himself before this prophet of God and asks Elisha to do something about his disease and he's expecting glitter. He's expecting incantations. He's expecting dancing and all kinds of things in order for him to be healed. But none of that happens. All Elisha does is he tells Naaman to go and wash in the dirty Jordan River seven times. And Naaman is aghast. How is this possible? This is nothing. There's no, there's no authority here. There's no power here. I'm going to go back to Syria. I can wash in the Syrian rivers, which are more clean than the Jordan. But one of Naaman's servants says to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? And Naaman goes and he washes, and he is clean. He's clean, not because of the fact that he washed in the Jordan River, but he is clean because God said he would be clean. According to, uh, through the prophet Elisha, God spoke to Naaman. And he said, if, this, if you do this, I will do this. It's a gift that God gave to Naaman, the gift of cleanliness. It didn't happen with a lot of glitz. It didn't happen with a lot of glory happen only according to the word of God. In our text for today, there is a succinct verse which deepens our understanding of how God chooses to function. <clears throat> Jesus says, and behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Jesus made himself last in the journals of humanity, and he suffered humiliation and death at the hands of an influential Sanhedrin and at a, a powerful political and military structure. He died a cruel and painful death in a cruel, cruel and unusual manner. Christ made himself nothing to bring salvation to you. Isaiah 53 says it best, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jesus, dying on a cross, is not very attractive in human eyes, but it is the way that God has worked to bring to you the salvation you need. As a church, we have many options open to us. We can conduct ourselves according to a whole range of models and paradigms, how we use the money God has entrusted to us, how we extend our stewardship into each other's lives and into the life of this community matters and is important. The decisions that every board and professional and member makes with regard to the function of the truth, it matters. But remember, God does not call us to be glittery and attractive. To be the church that God wants us to be doesn't necessarily mean having the biggest church in the community or the most charismatic pastor or staff. To be the church God wants you to be doesn't mean that you worship in the most popular and glitzy kind of way. Popularity does not define you as the church. What defines you, what defines us, is what we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts. What defines us is what we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. What defines you is what God has called you to be. He calls you to be faithful to the gospel of Christ. He calls his church to be the steward of the mysteries of Christ. He calls his church to proclaim the message of the grace of God through Christ Jesus to a world that is spiritually corrupt and dead. 
He calls his church to administer word and sacrament according to his command and according to his institution. And he promises to work in those things. It is only in this that we are certain that we are doing what God wants and that God is indeed doing what he has promised. So we strive. We strive to enter through the narrow door. And that striving is simply believing. Faith and belief is something that God has given to you as he has worked through this body, through this church, and we can give thanks to our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.